What's up? It's Jeremy Picker from Amber Creative. This is Deanna with In The Zoning and Prank Girl Mafia. This is Ray Weiss with Printing the Night of the Lion. You're listening to the Two Regular Guys podcast. Hosted by Terry Combs RG, regular guy from Aaron Montgomery. The place to be for industry news. The best dad jokes on earth, along with relevant topics to apparel decorators. Fashion to the people. All right, welcome into the show. It is Friday, March 8th, 2024. I'm Terry Combs, and you can find me at terrycombs.com. And I'm Mary Montgomery from our success group. And uh, my goal is to help proactive small business owners cultivate an uncommon mindset. And uh, I think uh, today is going to be right in line with that, Terry. We're going to be talking about uh, production efficiency. And uh, a lot of times, I think, especially a lot of things I've learned from you, can kind of be counterintuitive to the way that we might normally operate. So uh, I, I feel like we're going to hit some of those points today. I I love having this conversation with you. There's a few people that geek out about this kind of stuff more than I do, and, and you are one of them. <laughs> I've got my legal pad. I've got my Excel spreadsheet. I've got <laughs> I mean, you are set and ready. So it's going to be a great, great conversation today, Terry. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it as well. And make sure you stay till the very end uh, for your helping of the secret sauce. And I'll be bringing the sauce on screen printing today. And we're going to be discussing using the proper mesh count for the job. And here's a little spoiler. Most screen printers use the wrong mesh count. So speaking of geeking out. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. What about non-screen printers? Do we use the wrong mesh count? Well, yes. And, okay. uh, and, and see, the, and if you're not a screen printer, you can watch this and, and sound really smart to your screen printing friends. They'll be like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, and from, from a reality, yes, that's fun. But from a reality standpoint, too, I mean, if you're not a screen printer, you've probably jobbed out screen printing at some point if you're a decorator, right? I mean, th- what's the right tool for the job and uh you know being able to talk to your screen printers understand do they know what the right mesh count is oh they don't well maybe i need to find somebody that does right so this is a regardless of whether you're a screen printer or not eric you can stay tuned in even as an embroiderer okay (laughs) (laughs) exactly Uh, all right news about the news right we have news about the news. Yeah, our, our good friend Marsha Derryberry from Screen Printing Magazine, uh, and I love that I get to say that now. Um, <laughs> the, just the juggle. It's like, okay, wait, they were there, there, but uh, no, I, I'm <laughs> glad to have her back in that role that seems so familiar as a as a leader of a major industry trade magazine. Um, internet issues have uh, caused her some consternation this morning, so uh, I am going to do my best, Marsha Derryberry impression. Or actually, just read the news, and uh, <laughs> and we'll go from there. So, does that sound like a good plan, Terry? That's, that sounds like a good plan. Let's do it. All right. All right. Well, we got these headlines for Marsha, and and you can check them out over at ScreenPrintingMagazine.com. Uh, first uh, off, No Bowl chooses stalls DTF transfers for the NFL Combine Apparel. Uh, the official on-field supplier of the 2024 NFL Combine has chosen stalls to provide ultra-color max direct-to-film transfers for all athlete and staff apparel. Uh, in 2022, no bull, no bull was announced as the official training partner of the NFL. And you can uh, check out that press release over there at screenprintingmagazine.com and, uh, and and read more about that. So congratulations to Stalls. Stalls has always been very um, deep in with the folks over at the NFL. They do the uh, the draft and all that kind of stuff. So just getting a little bit deeper. I love it. All right. Uh, second headline here today is... Arcus Printers launches new website for decorating equipment customers. So a provider of decorating equipment, including direct-to-film printers, UV DTF printers, DTF software, and sublimation printers, has a new website to enhance their customer experience and provide easy access to innovative products and services. So check that out over at Screen Printing Magazine, and uh, you can read more about that there um, and and get a little more detail on that. So congrats to them on the new website. And then last but not least, this is actually a bonus from me. Uh, (laughs) So, hey, 
I'm Marsha. Now I'm me. Okay, whatever. Uh, so Impressions has announced their call for speakers for the Fort Worth show this fall here in 2024. So if you are somebody who is uh, interested in sharing your knowledge, um, and you, you can go back to our episode if you went back to how to how to do that and how to create that. But uh, this is your chance. This is a great opportunity. They're looking for fresh voices. They're looking for diversity. And uh, I think this is a great opportunity for you. So we will have the link. There's, the link is in the comments there, but uh, I won't try to read it all there. It's a, it's a long link. Uh, deadlines to submit are the end of the month here, Friday, March 29, 2024. So get your ideas together and uh, and go ahead and, and submit for Fort Worth. So looking forward to uh, seeing some new fresh faces out there in Fort Worth. So that is all the news that we have for you guys today. So uh, here we go. You know, those no bull shirts, uh, I, I didn't know that stalls had done them, but super clean. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of the uh, uh, of the uh, um, combine, but the, the, it would be like each shirt would be like RB1, RB2, running back one, running back two, yeah. running back yeah. three or yeah. tight end one, tight end two. Yeah. Uh, it was it was uh, kind of cool looking. So uh, nice good on those yeah. guys. Yeah. yeah. No, I did not watch any of the combine. I watch very little TV and uh, honestly if it's not the super bowl i barely watch and i barely watch the super bowl so <laughs> i know go, i know go chiefs oh baby yeah <laughs> and, and you know being a 35 year fan 35 years or so i deserve this because because i i've been to the to the wasteland <laughs> I've, I've been to the wide right uh field goal from 25 yards to not make the playoffs so yeah. Well, you're not a Vikings fan though, so they, you've got uh, yeah. plenty of room to bottom out yet. So <laughs> they, have cool, they have cool helmets, so they they've do. got that. They do. All right. <laughs> well, let's check in with the regulators who are tuned in this morning. Uh, we have Charles checking in. Good morning, everyone from New Mexico, and uh, good to see you, Charles. Hopefully, you're doing well. Ramona saying good morning, Aaron, Terry, and Eric. You too. So good morning. Thanks for being here, Ramona. And Rena Cooper, good morning, gentlemen. I, I didn't see the quotes on that, Rena. Can you get that uh, fixed <laughs> up for us, please? Yeah. <laughs> for our podcast see. listeners, yes, we're air quoting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Terry. <laughs> Doug, good morning from Los Angeles. And uh, then we got all the details about the news there. So again, thanks to Marsha for sharing those details with us. Sorry that she couldn't be here with us. And she's like, I really do love doing it. I promise I'm not. I'm like, we're good, Marsha. We get it. Internet yeah. things happen. <laughs> are you are you picturing Marsha though sitting there at her desk and and listening to the, that AOL tone? Remember the AOL tone? <laughs> no, it's not connecting. <laughs> I, I think she is out in the hills of Tennessee, if I remember correctly. So that could be it. The the, the, the dial up just isn't working for her today. All right. Um, so thank you guys for checking in and tuning in. And uh, Terry, we've got some really great stuff for people. So if you guys don't uh, take a, just a quick moment now. We'll give you 30 seconds to do this because we've got the dad joke. So I don't want you to leave for that, but just make sure that you're sharing this with your friends and, and like subscribe, do all that fun stuff as well. And make sure that uh, people know that we're, we're going to be talking about something that's going to be really useful for uh, decorators, for garment decorators, product decorators, whoever it's all about production efficiency today, Terry. And, and again, I'm so jazzed to talk to you about this of all people. I, I just, I've learned so much from you over the years and, um, I don't have my junior yellow legal pad, but I do have a whiteboard and a dry erase marker. So I am ready. Very nice. <laughs> but Very nice. <laughs> I alluded to it already, Terry. You've got a fantastic dad joke. Um, I'm giggling just reading it. Uh, so can you, uh, are you ready for that? I'm ready. Let's do this. Okay. So Aaron, is it okay that I start drinking as soon as the kids get to school? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bad teacher. <laughs> Eric, are you shaking your head? <laughs> yeah. uh, he's actually laughing on this one. So I think we have a winner. Oh, that's a, that is a really good one. I, I can envision the uh, kids at my son's junior high school going, oh, we're not supposed to. <laughs> I've certainly known some teachers uh, and, and I went to a party one day 
uh, on the last day of school. And they, these were all middle school teachers. And you think the kids are excited for the end of the school year? Oh, my gosh. These guys were nuts. <laughs> I <laughs> bet. games and <laughs> it, was, it was insane. <laughs> oh, man. Too fun. Too fun. All, all right. right. Well, well, how about a little housekeeping, Terry? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, to everybody, for checking out the Two Regular Guys podcast. And we need your voices still. We would love to have the regulators participate in our show intros. You guys have been hearing all the, the new show intros. So, uh, you know, join in. You can go to decorators.inkink forward slash intro, read a few sentences and be a part of the show and uh, don't be left out. And as Aaron mentioned, uh, we're always looking for new guests. If uh, anyone you know would like to join us, go to calendly.com uh, forward slash two, the number two, regular guys <laughs> to book a future episode or email us at info at two regular guys.com with your show ideas. If you're listening to the podcast version of our show, we appreciate you sharing the two regular guys podcast with all of your industry friends so they can become regulators too. We would appreciate you giving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Podcasts, YouTube Podcasts, wherever you do your podcast listening. We are there, thanks to Aaron. And if you're watching us live right now, please join in with your comments and your questions about production floor efficiency. And this just doesn't, uh, we're not just talking about screen printing, we're talking about all kinds of, of production efficiency. So please join Absolutely. in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a really good point, Terry, that this is definitely... And honestly, I think you can even look at this and take this, even if you don't do production, like a service-based business can look at these sure. same kinds of concepts, right? I mean, obviously, yes, production is is what we're kind of getting into the meat of here today, but, but understand what the concept is and see how you can implement it in how you take orders from your customers, how you do the artwork, how you, I mean, all of sure. this stuff, the same kind of concepts can work. So anyhow, all right, well. We, we've already started talking about Terry, so you're ready to dive into this here? Yeah, we're still in. <laughs> Welcome right. in our guest, Terry. <laughs> yeah. So, Terry, can you just spin around in your chair? And uh, <laughs> yeah. so, it's Terry, I, as I mentioned, I, asked. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am uber excited about this. I know this is a passion area for you, and 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 I also understand how critical this is for businesses. I, I, I get the joy of working with a lot of small businesses and. And they don't think they need to worry about efficiency because they don't have enough work yet or, or whatever their their justification is for not having good systems in place when it comes to this. And um, my reply to them is always, well, you don't have enough work yet because you're not efficient enough to be able to take it on. We, the efficiency actually creates more room and allows us to grow um, and, and we'll fill in the space that we have. So if you're a master of this and, and and I know you have changed many print shops, your own included, but then from big to small, uh, you know, I'm sure there'll probably be a story in, in here, Terry, one or two, right? <laughs> but remember we, we agreed. I only have eight stories. I just package them differently. <laughs> <laughs> Top them up. All right. Well, but the, the reason that that's true is because they're, they're good stories. They should, they prove the point. Right. And, but so I, I know you've got lots of great ideas about this. And so this is going to be kind of part me interviewing you, geeking out, and then kind of part discussion. So does that uh, does that work for you? Yeah. And, and Aaron, uh, to your point also, uh, start with good habits now. Start, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like you're a, a, a big a big company with lots of employees. And and because then you're, if, if you don't, you're shifting gears all the time. You're shifting gears on how you do things. So start yeah. start with the on, on the on the right track i love that perfect perfect there you go golden nugget already you guys so all right <laughs> terry well let, let, let's start here then um we've got a, a little kind of keep us on track outline here but and we'll see how we do but uh, let's talk about the why right the reason that production efficiency is so important well, you know, I, the, there, there's a couple of reasons. One is just getting the product out the door to meet your cups, customers' needs. You know, keep our promises. Yeah. Uh, and, and Aaron, you know this. You most, good work, deliver on time. What? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> exactly. Good, sorry, good work, deliver on that time. <laughs> that's, the key, that's the key to screen printing. You know, every time somebody uh, comes in late to my screen printing class as they're walking in the door, I'm like, and that's the secret of screen printing. <laughs> then everybody <laughs>, laughs at the person who came in late. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you know, j uh, most of uh, most shops, and by most, I mean almost all of them, they don't schedule production; they juggle production. Mm. And 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 if if that's the way that you operate, 
um, you ca you can't be efficient either. Not only are you uh, disappointing your customers and, and laying awake at night thinking, am I going to get this done? When am I supposed to do that? But, um, you know, you, you can combine tasks. For instance, if, if I schedule a week of production in a screen printing shop or any kind of shop, uh, but, but uh, my example is screen printing, I, I can actually prepare the screens for the entire week. If yeah. I'm juggling, oh, hey, and, and here's, the, here's the question. Um, the customer says, when can I get these? And the response is almost always, when do you need them? Well, yeah. guess what? They're, they're always going to tell you they need them way before they need them. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so then you're juggling and, and you're, you know, you're in the screen room, reburning screens or burning screens for the first time uh, or, or reclaiming screens because you don't, you know, you've got all these burned over here and, yeah. and this job's getting moved over there. And, and so you can be more efficient just by, uh, planning ahead and, and, uh, and scheduling your production. And, the other thing that you that you can accomplish here is you can make more money if you're efficient with the same equipment and the same staff. You don't you don't have to keep throwing money at this. You're you're not the U.S. government. You don't have to throw wads of money at something to fix it. <laughs> you're more efficient. And, and you know, Aaron, talking about efficiency, and and you had mentioned that I'd helped other shops uh, back when I was doing a lot of consulting. Uh, I, I did a thing called double your production in 30 days. And um, and so when I would be introduced by the owner of the company to the production staff, whether it was 10 people or, or 100 people, you could always pick out the screen print operators because their eyes turned into saucers. So they were like, wait, what? Double our production? I can't print twice as fast. Well, you don't have to in a screen printing shop, just like other types of decorating, yeah. the, the, the printing is the easy part. It's all the other tasks that are yep. inefficient that take take up our time. And, and so uh, by being more efficient with everything we do, we can get a lot more product out the door with the exact same equipment, the exact same staff. And literally, uh, you can double your production by making all the other parts of the process more efficient. And, and, and sometimes those are easy, easy things. So, sometimes they're pain points. Um, you know, when, when I go into a shop and say, mm -hmm. okay, who schedules production? Almost always it's the sales manager. Well, wait, the sales manager is scheduling the production department and, and guess what? A sales manager is just throwing orders into the funnel and, and, uh, the production staff is just, you know, tr trying to trying to stay ahead of the ball, you know. And yeah. so um, uh, I, I take that task away from them. I take it away from the sales manager and and give that scheduling task to the production manager or the plant manager, whoever's in charge of of getting the product out the door. But here here's my consolation to the sales manager. I'm going to give you 10 percent of the schedule. 10 percent of the schedule is open every week. And that's for those orders. Hey, Terry, can you squeeze this order in? I can. It's coming out of your 10% of production. But by that, that's the compromise, though, between production and sales, because, you know, in, in big production shops, well, maybe small production shops, it's it's sales button heads with, uh, with uh, production. And, and one of the efficiency things that, that I implement, and, and this drives salespeople crazy, is that <laughs> I don't put your order on the schedule until it's complete. And, and that means, hey, I'll get the sizes to you by Friday, but go ahead and get me on the schedule. I'll put you on the schedule when the order is complete. And, and because here's what happens. If, if you go ahead and drop it into the schedule, then somebody's knocking on your office door going, hey, uh, you know, I've got the screens, I got, uh, I got the, the ink, everything by the press, but there's still no sizes on this order. I'm, what are we supposed to do? Oh, well, stop what you're doing and move another order into its place. So inefficient. So anyway, just an example of, uh, of, of things that you can do to, to improve your efficiency on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's some great stuff, Terry. And, and, and again, going back to what we talked about right at the very beginning there, this, this is all shops, right? So you said, you know, the, the printing's kind of the easy part. I mean, the same thing with sublimation, right? Like 
putting it in the press and closing it, that's the easy part. It's the prep. Right. It's the making sure things are lined up, taping the, uh, getting things, you know, I mean, just getting, getting things in a line, right? So if you have a schedule of production, okay, I've got my, you know, hundred coffee mugs laid out and I've got the blowout paper to go along with it. I've got the, you know, this, that, and the other thing, right? Oh, same thing with your, your uh, transfers or, or your direct to garment, right? We, we know what colors we kind of got a logical order to get things through. My transfers are cut. <laughs> I, I think that that's the part that I think is hilarious about what's going on with DTF in our world is we've got all this cool technology and, and things are kind of growing and then, yep, get a pair of scissors out and <laughs> go to town, right? <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, there's, so still... there's, there's much to be improved in the DTF arena. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I and I talk to people every day that are doing DTF and there's and there's all these different methods of getting those those cut and and matched up. And so I think yeah. we're in the early stages. So it's an opportunity out there for people yeah, to, yeah, to but... scratch your head and figure out because everything that I've ever done on production floor stemmed from me when I had my own business, um, standing in the middle of my production floor, scratching my head going, there's got to be a better way to do this because I'm that nerd, as you said, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Can, I love that. Um, and then you, the one other, oh, go sure. ahead. Sure. I was no, just going to say, can I give you an example of, of yes. sales, scheduling production? And yes, I know you've yes, heard yes, this, yes. Aaron, but, but, um, I, I was doing a consultation, uh, for somebody that, um, <clears throat> they were doing, uh, boxer shorts. I, and I later went there and became their plant manager, but it's, I went for a two week consultation. I stayed for six years, but, um, but I'm looking at the schedule board and, and the scheduled person, the assistant to the sales manager was putting these magnets up on the schedule board. And there must've been 75 of these magnets on the schedule board. Some of them and the due dates were three and four months old. And, and I'm watching her <clears throat> and I'm like, so, how many of these magnets do you put on the board every day? Six. Uh, the sales manager says we have to we have to get out six of these a day, and and these were big production runs. And uh, I said, how many magnets do you take off the board every day? Uh, usually two. I'm like, okay, you put six on, you take off two. At, at what point here are you catching up? And and she goes, well, I don't know. <laughs> and and so <laughs> here's another hard truth. A lot of people schedule according to what they wish they could do or what they could do in a perfect world. They don't schedule according to what they're capable of doing. Now, and, and so they need they needed to hold off on putting more of those orders on. Did, now, did we become much more efficient? Yeah, we were blowing orders out the door uh, yeah. by the time. Uh, you know, I went and bought a big jumbo oval for all you old time screen printers uh, to print 22 <laughs> by 30 inch fabric panels to make these boxer shorts. And and we were just hammering through that that production schedule. But before that point, you have to schedule according to what you're capable of doing today, not what you yeah. wish you could do tomorrow. So yeah, and it, it's, yeah. it's a hard fact. Sometimes you have to tell a customer, you know, I, I can't get to this for three weeks now. In this in today's world, that's a that's a tough thing to be able to to, to do. But until yeah. you get your efficiency where it needs to be, you have to schedule accordingly. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that actually, I'm glad that you told that story before I started talking because that that's perfect to what I was gonna kind of mention. Because yeah, we we think that again, customer this idea of customer service is when do you need it, right? I, you, you you got me kind of thinking about that, right? If our, your idea of how do you manage it. When do you need it? Right. But the, the reality is you're going to fall short on that. Right. Like you said, you, you're going to get behind, you're going to, and, and so good customer service really kind of being good to your customers doing good work and delivering on time it, is to set those expectations. Like you just said, what, what is it that you can do right now? Now, if I've always said, you know, just throw the sales at it, right. You're going to figure out those efficiencies. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on the, the that side of it a little bit. And I, and I know there's going to be some pain to that, but sometimes we try to like make it perfect before we even have the orders for it. So it is that, that juggling act a little bit, but um, Terry, can we, let, let's hit a couple of the, uh, the comments in here just to, sure. because I, I would love to hear your take on, on what Becky had shared. Um, but Mike uh, checking in. Good morning. Good morning to Dan, Tom, 
bar checking in. Thank you for being here, you guys. Um, Mike said, uh, we've been running in a split shop for five years. Last month, we moved the second location 39 minutes closer. Can't wait to see the gains from the easier logistics. Um, I think the the logistics definitely are, are part of this, and we'll talk about that, I believe. Um, Jeremy, checking in from uh, for, with Picker. Uh, Amber Creative, excuse me, Jeremy Picker. Uh, and greetings from snowy Denver. Yeah, we, yep, it's that time of year, right? <laughs> and then uh, we won't put it up on screen because it'll cover the whole screen here. But if you want to uh, hear some interesting, uh, some really good points about art, uh, go to our Facebook page and look up this episode here and and read Dot Tone Dan Campbell's about production art efficiency methods. So, but here's the comment that I wanted you to to get your take on, Terry. Becky says, listening to Terry. Uh, talk is like listening to someone talk about my life. It's a constant juggle, but I almost never miss a deadline. It's a challenging job. So what, what, what would be your, what say you? <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, I, I think that uh, the, the big thing for me was figuring out estimating production time. And we've talked about it here on the show many times, but w w what I do with, uh, with a, with a screen printing order, and you could do this with any type of order is I have simple formulas for one color, two color, three color. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have, uh, I, I've, I've tracked how long it takes to set up each of those jobs, how long it takes to tear down that job. And so in, in about 30 seconds, when an order comes in, I can calculate this order should take one hour and 15 minutes. And I do it in 15 minute increments and, um, and drop it into the schedule. So when somebody places an order with me, I can say this order will be ready Tuesday afternoon. And uh, the next order that comes in, I could say, okay, this will be ready first thing in the morning on Wednesday. So you can come by and pick up it on Wednesday. And and but those numbers are based on realistic numbers that that we can accomplish. Then I track how long it took to do that order. And so at the end of the week, I add up all the estimated times and add up all the all the actual production times and and look and see if we are at 100 percent or 120 percent or for 70 percent. And then I have to dig in and find out why why are we operating at a slower rate than than what we have actually timed in our shop. And by the way, timing something in your shop doesn't mean time one uh, four color job, yes. because here's what's going to happen. You're going to walk out with your stopwatch and everybody in your shop is going to be moving as fast as they can. And they have now set the standard that the only way that, that you can stay on your production schedule is to constantly move as fast as you can. That's not realistic. I mean, you have to, you have to do 25, 30, 50 jobs of three color and, and, and that then calculate how long it took to set it up, how long it took to print it, how long it took to tear it down. Yeah. And, and the time savings, the efficiency is in the, how long it took to set it up and how long to take it, how long to tear it down. So, yeah. Well, and I think to, to speaking of that too, Terry is even if you don't have production staff, right. I mean, even if it's yourself, like you've talked about just kind of doing a time study because go, okay, yeah, I can get this stuff done today. I can, well, you know, the phone's going to ring the, this is going to happen. You're going to have to go pick up the kids from school because they, they got sick or, I mean, all those things are going to happen. So what I found to be the best is I, I always talk to people, let's do, do a time study. Just like keep track of everything you do and do it for a two week period. That way you kind of get, you know, maybe that you've got a unique week there, but it kind of tends to level out. And then you can really understand a where your time's going, right? Oh, I, I, I can do this in an hour. Uh, it, but it actually took you four hours because you enjoyed playing with the creative side of it or whatever. Right. Or right. Yeah, so I, I think that that's so crucial. Like you said, start with that, start with a good foundation. And then when you have the employees, then, then that's just part of how you operate. Right. So, you know, kind of yeah. build, build that, have that same mentality of the efficiency in what I do and, and be honest with, with yourself and, and how you're scheduling that. So. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Becky says, I think most of my challenges are customers not knowing what they want, making changes or waiting for payment. Once it's scheduled, there are often little obstacles. And and so, yeah, I think that's partly, you know, just continuing to educate your, your customers. And it's not an order until you get payment. And so, you know, okay, I can't tell you when this is going to be done until you make payment. Yeah. 
Um, and I know that's a hard, hard thing to do. And, and like you said, Terry, those are hard, hard conversations to have, but the reality is you're not doing yourself and you're not doing them any favors by, um, you know, fixing their, their problems for them without, you know, them participating in that. <laughs> exactly right. Because they will come back. It will be the exact same scenario every time they come back. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. It's your friends that do this to you. It's your friends. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, oh, you, I know you don't worry about it. Okay. I've done <laughs> right. that way too many times. That's bitten me way too many times. And you, you just, unfortunately you take the licks and you, you move forward. So, all right, Terry. Well, I know we've already kind of dug into a lot of stuff, but, but when we start talking about, okay, now how do we get more efficient, right? You said double your production time in 30 days. Where do we start? Well, uh, first thing you have to do is look for the stumbling blocks or the choke points in production. And uh, might I share a story? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, I was I, at, uh, I was doing a, a consultation, and uh, I'm I'm you know I'm, I'm checking everything out. I'm in the art department. I'm out on the production floor. I'm in the screen room, and I'm like, why are you guys delivering film the day the orders do? Why are you guys burning the screens? Uh, and, and they're waiting at the at the press for you to, uh, uh, you know, deliver the screens. Why is that? Well, we don't get the orders right away. Well, well where are the orders? Well, the uh, owner of the company wants to look at every order uh, to make sure everything's right. And I'm like, well, what? So, so the orders literally sit on his desk until he has time to look at them before you guys can start working on them. Yeah. And I'm like, I went, I went to this owner and I said, do you need the original copy of this order or can, can they just make a photocopy so you can look through them? Oh yeah. Photocopy is fine. So it was as simple as that. Everybody was afraid to go ask him, Hey, could we get those orders? Because you have like 50 of them on your desk and I know you're busy, but we could go ahead and do the art. We could go ahead and get the screens ready. We, and so, so that was a, and, and, you know, talking about uh this is my life you know um every shop there's no perfect shop i i certainly never ran perfect shops yeah. i could get more and more efficient but there's always things that you can do to make things more efficient so so a lot of this is just and, and i've said this before be your own consultant follow an order through the process and and see where the choke points are see what's holding things up and yeah. and so uh, and, and along those lines, you, tracking downtime, and you can do yeah. this with any type of decoration, but you know, my experience is in screen printing, every time a press would stop for about two weeks, the the person at the end of the dryer belt would note how long it was stopped. And I had about 10 categories of reasons it was stopped. The mm -hmm. product, uh, art question, uh, something like that. And they would they would mark next to art, uh, 10 minutes. It was down for 10 minutes because the, the operator had to go ask the art department a question. And uh, it's always shocking to me because everybody thinks they know they know their, their shop. It's like a well-oiled machine. They know everything about what's happening in their shop. And, and you know, what, what I found was 60% of the downtime, the first time I ever did this, 60% of the downtime was because of an issue with a garment. And either they didn't bring the smalls, we're short a medium. And so what, what I did to fix it was every order, and it took more time, but every order that was pulled had to be counted twice. One person would count it, and then another person from that department would count it, and they would both sign their name. They would both sign their name on that yep. order. And if they're still wrong, then you know who to go talk to. I will guarantee you this. If you have people sign their name to an issue, they will make sure it's right there. You know, and, and another example, I had somebody, uh, somebody from uh, sales write on an order blue. That was the ink color blue. And I went and said, is it Navy? Is it Royal? Is it light blue? And she goes, Oh, it's, it's Navy. I'm like, okay, we'll sign on here that, that you're, that we're changing this to Navy. Oh, well, hold on. Let me call the customer. Oh, it was Royal. But as soon as I said, sign your name, then all of a sudden, I, I really need to make sure this is right. So anyway. I love it. Um, I love it. So, Eric, are uh, you keeping track of the stories, by the way? Do we have like a, a 
scoreboard in the back and which one of the 10 the, that was. The regulators eight. need to have a bingo card. <laughs> a bingo card. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I love it. Um, and, and, and you go ahead, oh, sorry, go, go ahead and make your comment. <laughs> no, I, I was just going to say like, this is, uh, I love all this because here, here's the other part about this again, regardless of what your shop is, solopreneurs to massive shops, this type of thing, right? Think tracking the downtime, looking for those choke points. This is the working on your business part of being a business owner that is, is required of us. And, and again, it comes down, like, I love your story about the orders sitting on the owner's desk, right? It was just a simple lack of communication, but if you're not actively trying to figure out, well, okay, what is that choke point? Right. And, and if it's just you, right, what, what is the, we got to be honest with ourselves. We, we, we don't always like to be a hundred percent honest with ourselves, but we know what the problems are deep down. We just haven't taken the time to slow down enough to be honest with ourselves and say, okay, I got to make this change. I got to do yeah. things differently. Right. I got to set expectations better, whatever that is. So go ahead. Tim. Yeah. You know, that that's a perfect uh, statement because uh, I, I remember consulting once and, and uh, I was going over this 40 page report I did on this production shop and, and this, the owner was, I, I could tell he was getting angry and he, he goes, Terry, we already know 80% of this. And I said, I, I know. And you paid me to come and tell you because you weren't doing anything about it. You, you knew it was, you knew it wasn't efficient yet. You still didn't do anything about it. So you, you, you paid somebody to come in and just tell you what you already know. So yeah. that's why I'm always saying, be your own consultant, you know, yeah, <laughs> you, you sure. know what, what things need to be changed. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, along those lines too, Aaron, especially if you're a, an owner or manager that, Hey, you used to, you used to do the, the, the transfers yourself, but you know, you, you had to, you had to move up and run your business and talk to customers and, and, and get a little separated away from production. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go out there on the production floor and gather everybody around and, 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 you know, buy pizza and say, tell me one thing that will make your job more efficient and easier. And they're going to tell you things that are going to be probably easy to fix that you never thought about, you never considered, because who knows more about getting your product done than the people out there producing the product. And, yeah. and so sometimes we get too far away from, from the staff and, and the staff maybe thinks, well, there's a better way to do this, but nobody cares about my opinion. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm constantly asking employees for their input and to the point where I don't have to ask anymore. They're just, they're just changing things themselves to make things run more smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. All right, Terry. Well, we got quite a bit more to, to go here, but let's take a, a quick break. I, this is actually a perfect segue because, uh, I've got an event coming up in June where people are going to be working on the foundation of their business, right? And and we won't go as in, in depth here, but we will talk about what your standard operating procedures are and and you know what that means, right? How, how do we align that with our core values? So anyhow, without further ado, can we uh, share a little bit about the uh, Fundamentals Live event coming up in June? Let's see. Are you a small business that's feeling overwhelmed and underpaid? Do you want to find more balance and fulfillment in your small business? We're here to share the good news about an upcoming small business retreat where you can come together as a community to facilitate falling in love with your business. That's right. We're incredibly excited to announce the June 2024 Small Business Workshop and Retreat called Fundamentals Live. This event is based on the book, The Fundamentals of Business Success, and it's going to be your community designed to align your entrepreneurial spirit with meaningful success strategies. Join us in O'Fallon, Missouri, just west of St. Louis, in discovering networking opportunities that go beyond mere connections. You're going to create relationships that inspire growth and collaboration. With only 40 seats available, spots are already filling up. Don't miss out on your chance to transform yourself and your business, June 7th and 8th in O'Fallon, Missouri. All right. All right. Well, I'm super excited about that, Terry. I can't wait for uh, people to come and, and just the, the transformation that's going to happen in their business. It's all about kind of aligning with what your values are and, and just watching how reducing that friction is, is going to change the way you run your business. So I, 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 I love your event at the end where everybody 
uh, pretends they're five years into the future of their business. Yeah. I think that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be awesome. We, we call it the future you party and, and we're going to kind of put the bow on it with, with that. And to be honest with you, my goal is to actually have that reunion five years later with folks and, and just celebrate. I mean, we'll, we'll have the confetti cannons, champagne bottles, whatever we need to do and just celebrate Oh my gosh, we did actually do all those things. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, back to what we're talking about here with the efficiency stuff, Terry. This has been fantastic already. Hopefully, you guys, the regulators, are getting stuff. If you have questions for Terry here or or me, but to, <laughs> Terry is the I'm I'm sitting here like writing notes myself, but um well, let's get into the next point. But you regulators ask questions too. We want to make this interactive. How do you, you know, you, you've talked because you've gone in and, and done the consulting and worked, but then also run these big shops or grew where you had employees and stuff like that. So how, how do we kind of make sure that everybody's on the same page? How do, how do we explain why to our staff? Well, yeah, and, and that's really important for uh, people to understand what it is that what, what their part in the process is. And and the, the phrase, because I said so, is not a motivator. Uh, <laughs> do this because I said so. Because if it doesn't make sense to, to your staff, then they're, they're not, they're not going to buy in. And, uh, and you know, maybe they're, you're not going to get the efficiency that you anticipate because they have to have an understanding of, of what their part in the, in, the, in the great cogs and wheels of the of production mean. Because... Uh, you know, everybody's job out there on the on the production floor um, is dependent on somebody else doing their job. And and so just explaining to people uh, why we're doing this is a motivator, you know, and here's something that people have to appreciate. Most people come to work and want to do a good job. But mm -hmm. but sometimes it, it, it takes you explaining to them the why of it. And, you know, we, we um, I remember one time. I can't remember what the reason was, but we had about six days of production to get out and, uh, and within a week's time. And, uh, and so I gathered everybody around and said, okay, we're, we're kind of in a predicament here. We've gotten ourselves behind and, and to meet our customers expectations, we've got to get basically six days worth of production out um, and in this week's time. And so whatever we can do to, to whatever I can do to help you or whatever we can all do together. And without me saying another word is uh, I noticed at break time, all the presses were still running. And, and what was happening is when everybody went on break, all my production floor supervisors went out and they took over the presses and just kept them going. And, you know, all those kinds of things, um, it, because people thought, well, first of all, they wanted to help the company. They wanted to do a good job. Yeah. And and so the long story short, we were done with all that production in four days. We, yeah. we got two extra days of production uh, accomplished just by everybody pitching in, helping wherever they could help. I had people in the art department coming out saying, hey, I'm all cut up. Is there something I can do? And, and so they're they're grabbing shirts off the end of the belt and folding them and things like that. So, but but you also have to have that relate. You, you can't be the because I said so manager yes. and have and have your employees kick butt and accomplish this task. So, yeah. um, yeah. explaining why is critically important to to everybody in the company. And and, yeah. and some people you know think well this is you know this is the entry level job. My my job isn't important to everybody else. But it is. So uh, it, you, you have to explain that to all all your staff. Yeah. No, I think that that's so crucial. I mean, honestly, this works works in life, right? My, my son plays on a, a volleyball team. There is a, another coach. It's not me. And even though I have jumped in and helped out a lot, the, this particular coach just um, she also runs the club. So I think she's juggling a little bit too much. And um, I could get myself fired here. But the reality is I, I their practice last night was you know, there was no explaining why it's just do this because I said so. And then because the kids weren't doing a very good job, she sat them all down and told them all what she didn't like about them. Right. And then expected them to be motivated after that. And I was like, 
right? And, and, and even her husband was helping out coaching, start, started to try to give him some positive feedback too. And she's like, stop. Like they don't earn it. I'm like, well, he, you're not going to get there. Right. And so not to see <laughs> too far away, but the reality is like you said, Terry, people want to come to work and do a good job. Right. We want to come into something and do a good job. And so I'm going to I want to talk about expectations here, too. And I, and I think that's kind of what you're saying here is you have to a have that relationship with them that, that it's not because I said so. But B, when you gather them all around to say, hey, here's where we're at. Here's the expectation of where we need to be to be successful. And by setting that clear expectation, then they went to work to figure out, okay, well, how can we get caught up? And like you said, the, the managers figured out a way to keep that machine running. So talk, before we, I'm going to move ahead here a little bit. Let, let's talk a little bit more about expectations and what that means. Well, you know, and, and, and by the way, everybody on the production staff was, they were so proud of themselves for accomplishing the task too, you know, and, 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 um, but, but expectations, you have to communicate what you expect. Mm. And, and as I mentioned before, your expectations have to be realistic. But, but it, it, my example is, I, I remember somebody coming up to me one time in a, on a production floor and saying, you know, this is what you get on your first day on the job, by the way, if you're, if you're running a production floor, somebody will come up and say, hey, uh, buddy, uh, we're probably going to have to get rid of Jim over here. <laughs> uh, because Jim's the slowest printer here. And, um, and he was just, you know, prodding along. He wasn't killing himself. But when I put, did estimated production time to all the orders, we found out that he was the most efficient printer there because he, he stayed on the job. He just, he set up the press, yep. he printed the job, he tore it down, he grabbed the next screen and set up the press. He wasn't killing himself, pulling or pushing the squeegee, but, but, um, on the flip side of that, you might have, uh, let's let's say um, you expect 75 shirts an hour off of a press. Yeah. Uh, somebody might be doing 50 and think I'm the best printer here because there, there was no expectation set of this is this is what you should be able to accomplish. Somebody's doing 100 shirts on that same press thinks, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be fired. I, 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 I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this fast enough. If you set the expectation and it should take two hours to set this job up print it, tear it down, then they, they can look at the clock and know where they are and know that they've met expectations and, uh, and feel good about their job. But, but if you don't, you know, I was doing a, a seminar years ago down in Dallas and somebody was asking me about, uh, you know, estimating production time and this and that. And I stopped and I said, uh, because they were talking about doing a four color job on white t-shirts. And I, I stopped and said, well, what are you doing now? And she said, well, we get about 10 shirts an hour. And the whole room was like gasped because she she had no idea that that was incredibly slow production. She She's just, you know, according to the decorators that she had hired, this is how long it takes to print a four color print. And so, you know. First of all, you have to you have to understand your own realistic expectations and then you have to communicate those with uh, with your staff all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think expectations are so important. And again, this is me going, going big picture, kind of taking a little bit further, but even going back to uh, dot to Dan's comment earlier about um, not getting any more orders from the, the police station, right? The, the, there, there was a expectations were not clear from, from either side there. You go read his, his comment earlier, but um, so it, it really does boil down to expectations and, I've always looked at it and, and this was a hard change to make when, when something doesn't go right or I'm, I'm let down, so to speak, I'm using air quotes for those listening on the podcast <laughs> side of things, <laughs> let down to change your thinking to what, how, how did I create, promote, or allow that to happen? Right. How are my expectations not clear? What do I need to do to make those expectations more clear? And are those expectations realistic? Right? I, my wife constant re, constantly reminds me that our son is 12 and you got to let him. I'm like, all right, I get it. Sorry. Uh, you know, I'm expecting because he does things that I'm like, gosh, this kid's going to do some amazing things. And then 
you know, then he's still a 12 year old. And I'm like, okay. All right. Yeah. So it's expectations are, are so <laughs> crucial, Terry. I, I think that's a, a, a good point. And then uh, Ramona says in here, she says, I recently watched a movie, the founders about McDonald's, the McDonald brothers actually developed their system and store layout by building it on a tennis court and having the team work the stations. Right. So getting, getting real clear, getting them to participate in, in that. Um, and she said she also read Mary Kay's bio, uh, the woman built a million dollar company that is still going even after death. That book contained awesome tried and true ways to build for yourself. So there you go. A couple awesome. opportunities there. So Terry, can I tell mine's not a, a story, but more of a, an antidote. Can I, can I tell sure. her? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, I get to work with a lot of small businesses that are that typically are solopreneurs. Right. It's, and, and so it's a different mindset, but again, like I said, still kind of the same. Um, and the way I've always kind of looked at it is we've got to look at the working in parts of our business, the, the creating, the making, the doing, the production, uh, all those other things as if you were a race car pit crew. Right. And so if you're a race car pit crew, if you ever watched a race, right, their job is to change the tires and put gas in it as fast as they possibly can to be as uber efficient as possible because seconds will make a difference between winning and losing, but they must get it exactly right. If they miss a lug nut and that tire falls off while that car is going 200 miles an hour, you're putting someone's life in danger, right? So I think that's ultimately what we've got to look at, right? And, and the way that those rate race car pit crews become so efficient is they've practiced, they've mapped it out. They've said, okay, what little change can I make? They've, they've got somebody standing behind the wall, leaning over and at an exact right moment, they're rolling a tire and then they're picking this up and this guy's going here and this guy's coming behind him and, and they've mapped that all out and they've looked at it and going back to what you talked about earlier, what, what's the thing that we could do to make this more efficient? So like I, I found this deal. So as a direct to garment printer, somebody that's printed on a direct to garment machine, you have a printer that a bed is coming out at towards you. Right. And so our human nature is to walk up to the front of that thing and grab the shirt. Right. But when I've grabbed that shirt from the front of it, now what do I do? It's got to go onto a heat press that is also kind of facing even if I turned around, so now I've got, if I'm holding it like this for the, those who listen to the podcast, I'm pretending like I'm holding a shirt up and I've got the print pointing at me, at you right now. So how do I get that on the heat press, right? I have to like flip it up maybe, or, or, you know, or, or kind of figure out how to change your, your, if you make this one change, just go up to the heat press and grab it backwards and pull it off. So the ink is now facing you. And now you can lay it on a heat press all because the way you addressed that machine, right? And will that save you time? A hundred percent. Will that save you money? Because when you're trying to flip that thing up onto the press, how many times is that wedding going to, right? So that's the type of thing that I've always kind of talked about. Yeah. So what, what, what's some of your take on, on that concept there, Terry? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I've, I've been in shops where, uh, the person would take a shirt off a off a screen printing press and literally walk ten feet to put it on the dryer, and and I've said you know either move the press or move the dryer right next to it so that it's one motion to pull yeah. the shirt off and drop it on the belt, pull yeah. the shirt off and drop it on the belt. Yeah. Uh, just something as simple as that. I have to explain that in every screen printing class because every place that we do class there I do classes, it's a showroom. And so everything is far apart. Now, Adam, <laughs> now in your shop, that dryer is going to be right here, right next to you. you <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm always looking at things like that when uh, to be more efficient. That's a great idea, by the way. And, yeah. uh, uh, and, and, and the crazy part is I learned that at, a, at you know selling yeah. those things at trade shows. Because not only were you like trying to figure it out, well, but you're also talking to somebody about it and you look like a real dummy when you mess up the shirt and that you're trying to give them <laughs> to them as a sample. And so it was easier just to kind of talk to them like this <laughs> with me having my back to the, the printer and them watching it come out. And then I could just grab it off and lay it right over there. So but I think the other part about that too, Terry, is is understanding like i said if you're walking 10 feet with that shirt a yes it's not very efficient b 
you're also, again, giving yourself plenty of opportunity to ruin that shirt. Right? <laughs> exactly. and, oh, I ran into this because not only was I walking 10 feet, but I had to do the the uh, obstacle course to get there. And, and that, like, <laughs> right. so even just like, where are the scissors, right? <laughs> Those people that are uh, embroiders, right? Where's your nippers, I think would be maybe what it is. Or um, I, so I, I'm sure we could pick out something with it. Like, where's where's your heat tape for sublimators and do you have to like pull off a piece and then cut like i the coolest thing i ever bought was this little tape dispenser that cuts the little pieces of tape so they're always about this long and we just spin it and we put three rolls of heat tape on there and you could pop 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 and i mean so just little things like that can yeah. go a long way terry yeah oh absolutely 100 percent. you know i'm thinking about your your uh example of of the of the of the pit crew and, and I'm sure they practice all day, every day doing that. And let's do it again. Let's do it again. And, and that uh, our end of this is, is training. I think training, training, mm. training, yep, yep, definitely. Um, uh, you know, always, always learning, always, uh, always sharing, you know, new ways to do things or, or sharing how we do things. And just yeah. so, you know, so the art department understands what the screen department has to do with those film positives, you know, and, Oh gosh, we could be, you know, we, we could have done it that way for you. All I had to do was ask. We didn't realize that, that mm -hmm. what we were doing was causing you extra work. Yeah. So, uh, I, I believe anybody that's ever listened to the two regular guys know that we are, we are training, training, training folks yeah. all about the education and, and you're keeping your staff trained. So, yeah, no, I think that's really, and again, why, why that's important. Right. So, um, yeah, I had a, production environment that I was a part of and, and just how they put the job ticket into the package to be shipped, right? Cause we were scanning a barcode on it and people were just kind of stuffing it down in there or, you know, some people would really fold it up. Some people would, you know, whatever. And then the person shipping would have to like dig it out, find the barcode. And so it's just like everybody put it in. So the barcode's facing up and, but we didn't just say, Hey, do it this way. We said, do it this way. And here's why. Right. And yeah. then so they knew that we were looking for efficiency. So then they would go, OK, well, if I got this from the person before me in this way, that'll help me be more efficient, too. And and just right on down the line. Well, but, and, and, and if they know that they're impacting somebody else's job. Oh, yeah, I could do it that way. I didn't think it mattered how I put it in. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and, and to kind of tie this up with a bow, cause I know we're getting a little short on time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, tracking efficiency. You know, mm. once, once you, uh, you know, and I'll give another example from screen printing, but it, it, it you know, applicable in, in other areas, but uh, I would take all those uh, for every, every operator uh, in my shops, I, I'll take the actual production time and the estimated production time and calculate you know, were we plus or minus and by how much? And, and, and this is a hard thing to take on, on a production floor. And I've done this many times consulting is on Monday morning when the, when the crew comes in, in the break room up on the wall is everybody's efficiency. Jim was at 80%. Susan was at 112%. Uh, Jim was at 90%. Guess what happens a week later? Every one of those percentages went up. Every mm -hmm. single one of them. Why? Because all of a sudden it's a competition. All of a sudden, everybody in, in the in the company sees, you know, who's the who's the best at what they do. And and so uh, it, pretty easy things to track. And uh, uh, it, it was hard for all those operators on day one. Uh, after that, it was a, a source of pride, you know, that, yeah. that people could look on there and say, oh man, I, I beat you by two percentage points this week. <laughs> in your face, you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you just using human nature there, Terry. I mean, that, that is human nature. It's competitiveness. Yeah. Even if you're not a competitive person, you have some of that inside of you somewhere. So it, right. it, like you said, it, it comes down to that having pride in your work and, uh, you know, people do. We just have to give them the ability to, to show that with tools like you just shared there, Terry. So that was fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, I could talk about this for days, but. <laughs> yep, yep, for sure. Can I, can I get one more comment in here, though? Um, yeah. Eric could put in, because I don't want to leave off any of our embroiderer friends here. So a big thing for our embroidery shop, staging blanks near the machines that were running them before production. So, um, And then uh, my big thing was also 
uh, and I'm not even going to get it, Eric, he, big word, sorry. Everything you need at arm's reach, each station, no hunting. So missing place, I think, is what uh, that. <laughs> I, 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 I agree 100%. And to the point where, you know, in, for, for in my like screen printing shops, every operator had their own set of squeegees. Because yeah. there's nothing worse than watching somebody wandering around. What are you doing? What are you looking for? Uh, I need a five inch squeegee and I, I can't find any. And I'm just going from station to station. That's <laughs> just, I mean, so just horrific loss of production time. So, yeah, yeah, there you go. So, if you want to, if you want to, uh, piss off terry <laughs> wander <laughs> around a production facility doing nothing all right <laughs> i could be in my office and and like uh the biggest shop i ran we had six uh or we had four automatic presses and we had six manual presses because our average production run was 48 to 72 pieces but I, I could be at my desk doing something else and know when one of those presses stopped i'm out the door <laughs> what are we down for are we is the job done <laughs> <laughs> so, love it love it anyway. all right well terry what is uh, coming up for you in the big book of travel there well big book of travel is happening today my uh, complete screen printing business course uh, i'm leaving for chicago this evening uh that class at atlas screen supply is sold out uh almost always those classes are sold out in chicago uh, my yeah. next class there will be june 8th and 8th and 9th i understand it's going to be 20 degrees when i get there tonight so uh, <laughs> uh, my next class at workhorse products in phoenix uh, it will be on may 4th and 5th it will not be 20 degrees yeah, so and, it might be a little warmer than that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll be uh, speaking at impressions expo in atlantic city on uh, friday march 22nd my presentation is everything you've heard about DTG and DTF printing on the internet is wrong. And all my upcoming events are at terrycombs.com. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, so I am uh, getting on a plane first thing tomorrow morning to head to Graphics Pro Expo in Irving, Texas. And uh, at 11 a.m., uh, I, I get in a few hours before that, and we'll be scooting right over to the convention center to uh, teach how to master pricing for profit. So I'm looking forward to uh, presenting that particular um I, i'm actually sandwiched right between lawn winters he's going to teach i'm going to come in teach give him a little bit of a break and then he's going to come back and teach so i'm like wow nice. I've, I've made it i'm uh teaching alongside uh, lawn winters so i uh, looking forward to that if anybody doesn't know lawn winters is a world renowned screen printer i mean yep. he's uh he's uh, fantastic yep for sure so um and and just a really great guy too so uh yeah. Then uh, right after that, I'll be getting home and, and getting packed up and ready to head up to Dax, Minnesota. Uh, not only do I have two classes there, but I'll be hanging out in the uh, the booth with Sean Stewart, who you guys met last week. I'll be hanging out with those guys a little bit and um, talking about the upcoming stuff for our success group there. But uh, the two classes I have there at Dax, Minnesota are the fundamentals of pricing your printing and fundamentals for small business growth. And that's happening on Friday, March 15th. Uh, I, too, will be in Atlantic City on uh, Thursday, March 21st from 9 a.m. to 1015. We'll be talking about elevating your business with AI, harnessing chat GPT for generative marketing. And yes, all hail Skynet. That's a requirement, <laughs> a contractual requirement when we talk about it. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the next day at uh, in Atlantic City there, I will be teaching uh how to master pricing, making your business unstoppable. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Linda, we will see you there in Atlantic City. Looking forward to meeting you. And uh, then, um, so th that's kind of my immediate big book of travel. But uh, as you guys heard, I am super excited about this event coming up June 7th and 8th, Fundamentals Live. And uh, definitely check that out. I, I'm curious to know who's who's interested, who's uh, kind of on the fence. Uh, reach out to me. But uh, Who's going to be there at that event? Uh, so raise your hand. Let me know you're going to be there. Um, the other couple of quick things here, uh, the Fundamentals of Business Success book is out there. It is available. You can go find it on Amazon or you can just go to osg.link forward slash FBS. Uh, been getting lots of great feedback and and uh, really using it as the, the structure that we're teaching people to have their foundation um and then last but not least here on wednesday mornings you can catch osg live it's a collaboration between myself tanya deutscher becky kotzer and my wife kyleen montgomery and uh, we explore the power of gratitude and we celebrate wins and we we have some segments uh, from uncommon mindset to wellness toolbox we're just kind of looking at the small business owner at a at a holistic level 
and we talk about those concepts. So you can tune in live. OSG.com is where you can tune in uh, 7 a.m. Central Time, Center of the Universe Time. Uh, but you can always go back there and check the, the replays out at any time as well. So that's what I've got happening. Terry, I'm going to share uh, what Eric's got coming up here and then uh, we'll get you ready for the secret sauce here. So Absolutely. Um, exciting day today for the take up. For those of you that have been longtime take up fans, uh, make sure that uh, you do not miss out today. It's uh, episode one of a new uh, segment. Eric will explain it better than me, but he's doing a new thing where he's going to start interviewing some people from time to time too. And so they've got the first episode of Thread Break, and it's going to feature Joe Kramer. And uh, Joe is a fantastic guy. We've had him on here on Two Regular Guys, and and I uh, just love talking to Joe. He's super smart, and so he's going to be joining Eric for the Take Up, their first session of Thread Break, where he's going to interview inspirational folks in the embroidery world and uh, joe is an embroidery designer and digitizer with chops that took him from retail fashion world through to creating incredible custom treatments and his no-nonsense approach to sourcing is only outdone by his creative and eye-catching embroidery styles so check that out make sure you tune in at erickcampbell.com and then uh, we will be uh, able to catch up with Eric at Dax, Minnesota, coming up March 15th and 16th. And you'll find Eric teaching back to back on the 16th, uh, covering vintage values and digitizing details. So if you'll head over to DaxShow.com, you can get more information and uh, join Eric there in his classes. So whew, lots of great stuff coming up. So uh, Red hopefully you I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eric. It's, so, it's like the Joker talking about Batman. Where does he come up with those fantastic toys? Where does he come <laughs> up with those fantastic names? <laughs> that's right. That's right. We're just going to have to have Eric name all of our stuff from now on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, it's secret sauce time, Terry. I am ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. My secret sauce today is using proper mesh uh, for the job, proper mesh count. Uh, most screen printers use the wrong mesh count. I mean, a huge majority of screen printers do not use the proper mesh count on their production floors. And almost always the mesh count is too low. So what is mesh count? Simply put, it's the number of threads per inch in a screen mesh. So an 87 mesh has 87 threads per inch. A 305 mesh has 305 threads per inch. So what does that mean to us? the openings in an 87 mesh uh, are gonna be bigger than openings in a 305 mesh. There's more, more threads in a 305, those holes are smaller. So bigger openings lay down more ink. So uh, lower mesh counts mean that more ink lay down and vice versa. So why do we have different mesh counts in the first place? Different screen printing applications require different kinds of, uh, different kinds of mesh. So puff ink, for instance, you need to, to print that through an 87 mesh because we need a heavier laid out of ink to make the ink puff up on the shirt. Simulated process or photographic reproduction printing requires the color to be printed through a 305 mesh because we need a very minimal lay down of ink. So um, you might be thinking, why don't my mesh count numbers match the numbers you're telling us, Terry? Well, I might say 87 mesh, but your supplier, when you order that mesh, you get an 86 mesh. Uh, the reason for that is all mesh is, is manufactured in either Europe or Asia. So what does that mean to us measurement wise? It's all metric. So when it's imported into the US, we convert it to inches because none of us except for Eric knows the metric system. So if, if a supplier gets uh, an 87 mesh, but, uh, but the next shipment they get is 86 threads per inch. You think you're going to go change their brochures and change their price sheet or change their website? No. As long as it's close, that's the number they use. So if your mesh count numbers are within a couple of the ones I'm talking about here, you're still good to go. But most people use too low mesh count. And, and here's why. First is misinformation. When I started screen printing in a previous century, uh, it, was, it was common to say, all you need are 110 mesh screens. And in my classes still today, I have people say, well, that's the advice I got from my supplier. They said, you, just buy 110 mesh screens. Or worse, you got that advice on the internet. So what's my go-to screen mesh for most of the work I do? It's a 160 mesh, not a, not a 110 mesh. Uh, the other reason would be trying to take a shortcut. 
The thought being, if I lay down more ink with a 110 mesh, I won't have to flash and print a second coat. So laying down too much ink in, in a single pass, like through a 110 mesh, uh, is going to give us a thick and sometimes even uneven print. So using a higher mesh, like a 160, gives us a very thin lay down of ink. We're going to flash it for about 15 seconds, and then we're going to print with the same screen right on top again. So the result is a 100% thinner and more crisp image than using a lower mesh count to save a print stroke. So a, a print that this, this is going to give you a print that will separate you from the competition. It's going to separate you from being a, a, a it, from from being a, a, a someone who just gets the job done to somebody who's turning out really, really great products. So it's screen printing. It's all about the screen. Get your screens right and you're 90% there. And that's my secret sauce for today. Here we go. We're out. <laughs> Wrong button, somebody. <laughs> All right, that was me. I pushed the wrong button. I'm going to jump in and just take it. Let's do the secret sauce outro, which looks a little bit like this. <laughs> All right. Hey, th these things happen even to uh, the, the the best of the best in the business here. So, um, you know, Eric has always been the uh, patron saint of uh, allowing people that it's okay to mess up. So um, <laughs> not, not that big of a deal. All right. Well, Terry, fantastic stuff. Now I know why misinformation and uh, trying those shortcuts. Band-Aids, huh? Interesting. Band-Aids, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Hey, we've come to the close of another show here on the Two Regular Guys podcast. Uh, Terry, thank you so much. Always just really, like I said, I was super excited to geek out with you on this. And um, you delivered once again. We've got uh, the bingo cards in production. So, you know, what, uh, <laughs> what stories to hit get, get bingo on. But no, really good stuff. Thank you, Terry. Good job. All right. Thank you. And uh, thanks to our show producer, Eric Campbell. I think Eric was flustered because I, I, I mentioned him in my secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I, I think so. But thank you very much, Eric. You are uh, amazing and we appreciate you uh, each and every week. So next week, uh, speaking of double duty and, and all this stuff, Eric is going to be the guest. Right. And we're going to be discussing the value of creative execution. So uh, cannot wait to, uh, man, just filling my brain with you guys. So I love it very much. Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looking forward to that uh, as well. Until then, I'm Terry Combs. He's Aaron Montgomery. And that was the two regular guys. Here we go. We're out. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for listening to Two Regular Guys. Check out our website at tworegularguys.com. That's the number two, regularguys.com. You can also interact with us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash tworegularguys, or send us a tweet, twitter.com slash tworegularguys. And we have a YouTube page. You can find all that from our website, tworegularguys.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to spending some time with you again next week.